This is Join Us in France, episode 306. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and today I bring you a conversation with Elise about the Vuitton Foundation and Museum to the west of Paris a little bit, just outside the Périphérique. That's the Paris Belt Road. It's easily accessible by metro. That's even on line one. And the museum is worth it just to see the building. But the art inside occasionally steals the show too. If you're going to Paris with kids or a geeky spouse, they will love this place even if they don't like art per se. And the kids will also love the Jardin d'Acclimatation that surrounds the Vuitton Foundation. Thank you, patrons, for giving me a precious gift, the time to produce this podcast. Your monthly gift makes it all possible, and it means so much to me. A shout out to new patrons and more info on how to join all my wonderful patrons after the interview. And if you become a patron during the month of October 2020, I'll send you a personalized postcard. How about that? Because it's my Patreon anniversary. Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 306, the numeral 306, where you can see a recap of what we've discussed. Follow Addicted to France on Instagram to see the photos of the Vuitton Foundation in Paris. It is truly spectacular. I'll post them this week. That's also where you can see photos of my doggies that are usually spectacular as well. <laughs> the best way to stay in touch with me and with the podcast is to sign up for the newsletter at joinusinfrance.com forward slash newsletter, newsletter. I am realizing more and more that people don't necessarily listen to the episode as soon as it comes out. Sometimes people email me about stuff that were on, you know, weeks ago, sometimes months months ago. Uh, so if you want to stay up to date, but you don't always listen to the episode as the second it comes out, the newsletter is for you. Today we are talking about uh, the Jardin d'Acclimatation. Oh, I should have made you say it first. No, I can't. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> I'll try. Acclimatation. Yes. You don't even have that word in English, do you? No, we don't need that word. <laughs> it's an extra word that is not necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what, so what, what we're talking about that and and the uh, but mostly the Louis Vuitton uh, Museum yeah. or some well, of both, maybe both, both of them. Actually, they belong in the same area. They're in the same area. They're they're right next to one another, right? And uh, Louis Vuitton, uh, the foundation, is the last in, in occupant of this uh, of this part. Park. Yeah, this park. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. yeah it's uh, it's very recent. It's a. It's the most recent museum in Paris. Yes, it's a contemporary art museum, and it's amazing. It is amazing as a structure. It is really amazing as a structure. Yeah, and that is thanks to its architect Frank Gehry. Yep, who was hired by Bernard Arnault, and I. I have to admit that there are two people who are super rich in France. There is uh, Pino and Arnault. Yes, and I always get them confused because they, between the two of them, they own everything that's luxury that's produced in France. Yeah, basically. Yeah, um, uh, and in this case, it's Bernard Arnault. Yeah, uh, uh, both of them, interestingly, they, they. I don't know if they actually know each other or if. Oh, they, probably. I would guess they do, but they are actually rivals in a sense because both of them have in their lives accumulated vast collections of art, mm -hmm. vast collections of art, mostly modern and contemporary art. And uh, both of them have had museums either built or named after them, uh, mm -hmm. both in France and in Venice, among other places. And so there's this interesting kind of rivalry between the two of them. There's a kind of competition about who's going to uh, open the next most incredible <laughs> looking museum and put their $5 billion worth of art inside it. 
Yeah, I think Arnaud has a leg up on this one. Yeah, I think he does. Yeah. And, uh, he also does indeed have a museum already in Venice. Uh, he mm. bought a nice little old 15th century palazzo mm-hmm. and turned it into a, an art museum there. And it's interesting that uh, what he did here was uh, he decided to have something built from scratch. Mm. It wasn't like he took yeah. an old, beautiful mansion in Paris a center right. or something like that. He apparently had wanted for a very long time to have a, a structure that would house his collection. Uh, he really does have one of the most important uh, private collections of uh, modern and contemporary art in the world. And uh, he wanted a place to put it. Now, I will be a little cynical and also say that as in most cases, by creating a museum and making it public, it's a great tax write-off too, you see. Oh, sure. So it's a good way of saying, okay, I've spent all this money and I have this fortune in art. Now what am I going to do with it because I'm not young anymore? And it's a fact that in France you get a better write-off for donating to a museum than you do donating to a church. Absolutely. You get no tax write-offs for donating to churches. Well, what would you donate to a church? Well, like I mean, uh, Denier du culte or whatever, ah, okay, you know, you, yeah, uh, right. or, or, or I'm sure mosques and... Uh, That's true. Do you, well, you, I guess you could pay for part of the building, you know, and that yeah. you would do. But, yeah, you, you, yeah, I mean... You wouldn't decorate who, them, though. No, no, but what I mean is people who, who go to church or right. synagogue or mosque usually donate to right. their church, that's right? that's true, that's right? true. And that's not a tax write-off in France. It's not a tax France. write-off in No, France. but donating to an association for right. guide dogs or for art or for whatever, some associations are tax write-offs. Yes. And art is a huge tax it's write-off a huge, in France. It's huge, huge tax yeah. write-off. It certainly is. Right? But, you know, I mean, it should be. that's okay. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's okay. I mean, that is how we get things in public collections. That is how yeah. you get them out of just private little mansions where only two people see them and, mm-hmm. and you get them to be available for a bigger public. Yeah. So that's that's fine with me. I yeah, mean, yeah. You know, um, th- so we... we had been talking uh, in another podcast about the Bois de Boulogne. And so uh, what uh, Bernard Arnault did in negotiating with the city of Paris was he negotiated to have a little corner, the northern uh, corner of the uh, Bois de Boulogne, um, a little section that's really not very big, that is right between up uh, against the right up against the the the, the jardin d'acclimatisation <laughs> le jardin d'acclimatisation and uh, also it it's really very close to neuilly which is a very right. posh 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 uh, suburb uh, on the western side of paris and apparently he met Frank Gehry in 2001. Now, 2001, 19 years ago. It's, I don't know if he'd ever actually met him personally before then, but it was in 2001 that he set up a meeting with Frank Gehry, who by that time uh, was already very, very famous as, oh, yeah. as an architect. And for those of you who have no idea who we're talking about, Frank Gehry was actually born in Canada. He's not young. He's now 91 years old, Mm -hmm. still going strong. But his career was really established in California. And uh, he is an architect who is an incredible innovator in both form and material. He has made incredible things using strange new materials. He has had materials created for him. So he's a very, very interesting and very non linear box-like style architect. Uh, mm-hmm, that is mm-hmm. to say the least about him. Yeah. And he's really famous for doing public buildings, lots and lots of museums, foundations. He does very little, pri- he has done a few private homes, uh, but not that many. He's not really famous for doing private homes. The one that did make him famous was his own that he built on this small lot in Santa Monica. And it's very odd because uh, it's there's a stretch of Santa Monica, and I know this because I was teaching this in, when I was at the uh, teaching at the art school here in in, in Toulouse. Uh, there's a strip of Santa Monica where the houses, even for the very wealthy, are packed next to one another because it's very precious land and it's right on the beachfront. Mm-hmm. And he bought himself this tiny little plot 
and I don't remember when, but it was a while ago. And he, you, you wouldn't even guess that you could actually make a nice house in the size of the plot that he bought. And he did this thing that looks like three ice cream cones twisted around and turned inside out. And I don't know what else you would call it, you know, and uh, with this very strange, he uses uh, very interesting metallic uh, materials that, that reflect light and everything. And it became famous. People would come from all over to, to see, see this, this weird, weird looking thing. Well, and the, the thing is, he does weird, but also very attractive. Yes. Be- because I've seen weird that was just weird. Yes. Yes, it's true. It's true, and and of course he's he uh, uh, has also done the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. Yes, which is wonderful. Yes, and 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 unlike other or some other um, modern architects who are uh, commissioned to do buildings that are museums, he has a knack for making something look very strange, really like a, almost like a spaceship. But also, once you get inside it, the space is really good for the artwork, which yeah. is what makes it so amazing to right. see. You know? Because some of them, they are weird looking and they are weird looking inside as well and not necessarily great for art. You know? Yeah. Uh, and, and in this case. So in 2001, uh, Bernard Arnault went to Frank Gehry and basically offered him the possibility of designing a space for him. Uh, for mm-hmm. Arno and for his collection. Mm-hmm. And uh, he told him where it was going to be. And uh, Frank Gehry went to this section of the Bois de Boulogne and he visited the Jardin of Acclimatation. Yes, bravo! And he said, <laughs> aha, what I am going to do in my inimitable way is I'm going to be inspired by both this garden that is literally, that just butts up right next to it. So when you go to the foundation, you actually can easily just go across literally and you go into the garden. Uh, or, and he was also uh, inspired, believe it or not, by the Grand Palais in Paris. Mm. Uh, mm. Frank Gehry has been to Paris a lot, uh, has, has had other offers in Europe uh, as well. But he said he wanted to do something because of the garden's being right next to where the foundation was going to be. And the spirit of this idea of, because the gardens were originally created in 1893, so it's the same time period as the Grand Palais, which is, of course, much, much, much glass yes. and, 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 and metallic structure. So he said, okay, I think I'm going to use those as ideas. Now, of course, we're talking about somebody who translates all of that into a typical Frank Gehry structure, yeah. which means it really does look like something from outer space. Yes, yeah, sails. Sails. Um, yes. I, I, it, it, it's, it's really hard to describe. It's hard to describe. Basically, yeah. what he does is he creates two structures. He creates the inner structure that is going to be where the rooms are or the spaces are that show artwork, where the staircases are, where, uh, in this case, the many terraces are also. This is like the inner interior structure. And then he includes, and I'm not sure how he does it in, in what order, he includes this superstructure that is uh, flowing and and in curves and is made out of very very incredible innovative material and this is indeed what he calls the sails. Uh, oh, he calls them sails. He calls them sails. Oh, yes. I didn't know that. <laughs> yes, and in fact, what he said about this ca- uh, uh, the the Fondation Vuitton is that it's made of twelve sails, and the base. Uh, is underneath, and literally that is what he himself has called them. If you can picture them. the opera house in uh, Australia, yes. in Sydney, right? it's that sort, but even it's more. But, but m- much more elaborate. Yes. Yeah. Yes, because uh, now I've never been there. I would love to. But uh, if I recall, it's just kind of one curve and arch, whereas in the case... And, of, and it's repeated. It's repeated. It's the same arch repeated several right. times. Whereas, whereas this is like... It's very irregular. Irregular, different shapes, right. different orientations. Yes. It is stunning. I it's mean, stunning. You, just, you just look at yeah. this thing and you just go, how can anybody conceptualize yeah. this sort of thing? And also 
draw the plans. Yeah. Now, I'm sure he didn't draw the plans. Well, I he, su- suppose he has, he has lots and lots of assistants yeah. now, of course. But but it is his concept. I mean, this is this, yeah. this is his idea. It's like there's this kind of overall superstructure. And of course, you're right. Each sail is slightly different shaped, mm-hmm. so the curves go off in different way, and they all face in different directions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, and I've I've been to the Bilbao one, and uh-huh. it's also very striking. Yes, but the one in Paris is above and beyond. Well, n- well. Okay, I now I did go to Bilbao longer ago than when I saw the Vuitton, which was just a couple of years ago. Um, actually, now, yeah, a couple of years ago. I guess I, I mean I love the one in Bilbao, and I love it particularly because part of the museum is the way he designed both the outside and the inside is because he knew that there were going to be a couple of permanent exhibits. One of them by this sculptor named Frank Serra, who is someone I like a lot whose work is huge, 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 Yeah, yeah, huge. like the big metal things. The big metal things. Yeah, the, those the, are amazing. The, they're amazing. <laughs> and so he had to accommodate, he had to make a space that would indeed work for this yeah. particular work, which, was, which he knew was going to go there. And when you walk around that thing, you feel dizzy. Yeah. You think, I, I thought I was going to drop, fall over. But that's the whole point. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the whole point. Yeah. It's amazing. It's that, amazing. That piece yeah. is amazing. Right. And, and, and the, the, but, but for the uh, Fondation Vuitton, the rooms are not as grandiose. The, the, the places for the art are actually much smaller. There, there are many of them. There right. are many, many of them. But the thing is that he wanted to create a space that would fit into its environment more. Mm-hmm. I think that's why it makes it, it looks so much better. And it's just, it, it, it shines, you know, because he, the materials he uses, he, he had a certain kind of uh, metallic uh, alloys made specifically for him. Uh, the, the building took a long time to finish. There were lots of problems. The city, at, after saying yes, apparently said no. Oh. And there were lots of problems. There was lots of negotiation between uh, uh, Bernard Arnault and the city about what was happening there. And I don't honestly know if it was because they didn't like the plans, which is a kind of a echo of what happened with Eiffel and the Eiffel Tower because they didn't like the plans once they saw them. And then there were people that were for it and there were people that were against it and all of that. Uh, but the entire structure is basically steel, uh, p- some kind of platinum. It's a kind of alloy of platinum uh, with some wood and glass. Mm-hmm. And there are 3,600 glass panels that reflect light and give energy. Hmm. Uh, the, it, the numbers in, the, in terms of what's in this building are absolutely amazing. Um, mm-hmm. It uh, seven hundred workers worked on it, mm-hmm. uh, and they invented some very very high tech materials to use. And it's all custom. It's, it's, all custom. Ev- it's all custom. Everything has to be custom because the sh- there's not a regular shape anywhere no. in there. Like no. all the angles are weird. Yeah. Um, they have these giant beams that are bolted wood. Bolted wood. That's right. And <laughs> bolted wood. It's really attractive. Yeah. But how how did they do this? I I don't. Know. They had to like only to read the plans. You had to. You couldn't give these plans to a regular builder and say, build me this. No. There's no way. No. There's no way. No. It's too complicated. No, it's much too complicated. <laughs> and, the, and, and one of the things that I remember loving about the museum, not so much paying attention to the artwork at all, which may be a little bit of a problem because the building itself I found almost more interesting than some of what was in it. Definitely. But it has so many different levels and terraces and gardens everywhere you turn and And so there's plants beautiful plants and you have sunshine and shadow and and there's a reflecting pool outside no it's it's It's, stunning it's stunning absolutely stunning it it covers almost twelve thousand square meters Mm -hmm. it's at the center 40 meters high inside the space not just the the sails that are covering Mm -hmm. the outside and uh um, nobody knows, except obviously um, Bernard Arnault, exactly how much it cost. The original estimation was supposed to be three to four hundred million. And no then way. there was a rumor that it was five. And now the rumor is that it was over eight hundred million. 
euros. I wouldn't be surprised at a billion that cost to fix. I wouldn't be surprised. It. It's it's um, as impressive as a modern cruise ship. Yeah, uh, it's it's just it's more poetic than a cruise ship. Much I think. more poetic. I think. Much um, more poetic. Now, this is what's interesting about the deal. So, Arno has a lease on this land. The building actually belongs to him. It belongs to the Vuitton Foundation, and he, of course, is the owner of Vuitton. But he only has it for 55 years, which, of course, means his descendants only have it 55 years. It's not that long. Usually these leases, leases are for no, 99. Yeah. Yeah. And at the end of the 55 years, which began in 2007, it becomes the property of the city of Paris. Oh, I see. So everything in it, that is everything that will be a money-making thing because one of the concepts he wanted in terms of making this uh, foundation was not just a space to show his art collection, but a conference space, a cinema space, a place for culture to be talked about, to be written about, to be studied about, to be shown about. And so it's a center for debates. They have master classes there. They have classes of cinema they do all kinds of teaching there. They have all kinds of shows as well as art. And so it's really become uh, a focal point for contemporary uh, performance in all of the arts, hmm. as well as the, you know just the, the visual arts. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably because he uh, doesn't need to leave that to his children, uh, and this was the deal that he made. So... Um, in 55 years, unfortunately, uh, I don't think I'll be here, and I don't know if you will be here, darling. <laughs> Probably not. But, uh, but children and grandchildren who are around now will definitely be able to, and it will be simply a museum of the city of Paris. Hmm. Not the art. It may still be called the Vuitton Foundation. Yeah. Maybe not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe they'll change the name of it. The last big exhibit that was there was an exhibit of the uh, American artist Basquiat. Who is a, a who was a young uh, artist, a painter whose work I absolutely love, who died um, now over twenty something years ago at the age of twenty seven, mm. uh, but whose work is uh, considered to be very very important, uh, and so there was a huge exhibit of his work in comparison with other artists at, at the same time, and that was the last big exhibit, and now of course. I don't know if there is something there right now, let's, to be honest, because, of course, with everything that's happened in the last months, uh, everything just was put it's on probably, hold. It's probably not open yet. I doubt it. I would doubt it very yeah. much. Yeah. But that's the Vuitton Foundation. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And uh, again, it is in the Bois de Boulogne, which means that you either have to take the number one and then as a shuttle, there's actually a, a shuttle that will take you to the but Yeah, but it's foundation. not a long walk. Or you can walk. Yeah, it's not a very long walk. Because it's not that long a walk. Yeah, no. And when you get out of the foundation, you go around the corner, you go around the back end where there's actually already some garden and some beautiful greenery, and you go to the... Jardin d'acclimatation. Very good, Eddie. All right, so this one is a weird one, okay? Yeah. And they're very lucky that they got Vuitton, the Vuitton Foundation yep. there because they probably got a boatload of money from that. Absolutely. Because this, the whole concept of Jardin d'Acclimatation is a big failure. <laughs> it's, it's a very strange concept, it's let's very face strange. it. Yeah. So it started as a place where you could show, it was almost like a zoo. Yes. But it, had, it was a zoo that had a big ethical problem. Yeah. In that they thought it was cool to show kangaroos alongside with aborigines. Yeah. And to show giraffes alongside with Africans. Right. And so it was a place where you'd come see these strange people. And, and exotic animals. And exotic animals. Right. And it, <laughs> nowadays, obviously, nobody would go for that. But they also had, you know, weird looking humans. Yes. Uh, that were too small or too big or right. big heads or big humps or right. whatever it was. Right. And it was huge at the time. Yeah. Uh, it was begun, actually, at the same time when, when, when Napoleon III and the Haussmann uh, decided to basically redo the entire Bois de Boulogne. They, 
the this was when the concept of this kind of garden came into being. I don't because there was already the Museum of Natural History and the Jardin des Plantes in in Paris. Yeah. Uh, but 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 I don't know where this idea came from to do this kind of a park. I really don't. But they put it there. They put it there at this corner of the Bois de Boulogne and uh, Neuilly. And uh, it was a place that uh, it was it was another attraction to go to see in the Bois de Boulogne. Yeah, you know, to to go to this park, which apparently also uh, hard to really understand how they put those two things together. This is what I was reading yesterday. They had all these exotic features, but also domestic animals. Animals. Uh, so it's very odd. It's, yeah, it, it's yeah, yeah. a very odd combination. Well, they they were putting stuff in there to hope, hopefully, I mean, they were hoping to attract families and curious yeah. people and whatever. I mean, remember, they didn't have TV. They didn't have uh, Twitter. Right, right. <laughs> Today, if you want to see weird things, you go online. You and go you, online. You go on YouTube and you will find all kinds of horrible things. But back then, if that was your thing, and I'm afraid it's the thing of a lot of people yeah. to see bizarre things. Yes. I think that's just human nature, you know. Just, the oddity. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember my nephew when he was little, he <laughs> he always wanted to show me on on YouTube uh People hurting themselves. Oh, ooh. you know, videos ooh. of people hurting. But this is still, they get millions of views, those videos. Yeah. People doing stupid things and hurting themselves. Anyway, uh, so we always had a kind of a desire to see the odd, the weird, the, the different, exotic, the yeah. exotic, whatever you want to call it. And, and, and they couched it in the, in this kind of packaging of science as well. It was science y, like, you know, and remember, we went from under barely understanding um, natural selection That's with right. with Darwin to eugenics. Yes, not long after. I'm not right. saying Darwin was a eugenicist; he wasn't. But right. people who followed him right. took his ideas and turned them into eugenics. And n- now we're m- we've moved for the most part. We've moved away from that. But it, it, it's weird how. Uh, the general interest yeah. of people evolves in bizarre ways. Well, it's also, I guess, I mean, we're, we're talking about the middle of the 19th century. By this time, many parts of the world have been explored, but there's still this idea of uh, the other as this, yeah. you know, odd, like, look at these strange people, these creatures, these, they, yeah. they, they, they don't seem to equate to the same way as people in Europe do, you right, know? right, right, and uh, and it is true that it was for a period of approximately twenty five years that this became the central attraction of this this park, and uh, they would show the people and the animals in the same context, exactly the same yeah. context. Yeah. You know, they were part of the same display. I mean, yeah. it was just you know, yeah, and they thing. and they organized it by country. Yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, and tough. and then it's interesting because it says that um, then there was one event which, of course, uh, I mentioned this to my husband yesterday. And he went, "Well, what did you expect?" You know, it's like it's like in 1870, 1871, when Paris was under siege from the Prussians uh, and people were starving, um, all the animals were taken and killed and eaten, yeah. including the elephants. Mm. Well, that made me very upset, but. Why yeah. should that make me more upset than any other animal? I don't know. It does, though. Uh, and so uh, this was a big deal because these were very uh, these were animals that had been there a long time, mm-hmm. and uh, it, so it was a big deal that this happened. And so, it, yeah. We, and then governments, so African leaders would give Alexander the um, Third, Napoleon, Napoleon the Third. Exotic animals. That uh-huh. was a gift it was from a, gift. a country, right? You know, uh, <laughs> well, yeah. you know. I mean, it was a, it, yes, it was a very strange time in term, and colonial and powers everywhere were kind of divvying up everything. Anyway, you know. Mm-hmm. So apparently, uh, it was kind of reorganized after the siege of Paris, starting in 1872, and then uh, it. The the showing of people more or less stopped, thank goodness. Mm-hmm. And then um, basically it was remodeled again completely in 1930. 
probably because that coincides with when they did Trocadero and all of the buildings. So they they that was when they started to introduce things like the exotic little Japanese tea house and the little bridges and uh, all kinds of little things, more uh, structural exoticism than animal exotics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Although they still had animals apparently until the 1950s. Wow. I didn't know that until the 1950s. But then what they started to do was they made it more into a park of attractions. Right. And it's kind of like a, an introduction to what would be a universal world's fair where you have a pavilion from different parts of the world with a structure that reminds people of that particular part of the world. Right. Except there's no food here. I mean, there are a couple of – um, there's a very nice little tea house that does serve ice cream. I do remember that. <laughs> you know, as well as a couple of places where you can get popcorn and uh, – cotton candy and stuff like that because of course now uh what they want to do is attract families with children but but what's interesting is that the transition that went from being a place that to our mind is shocking because of what it displayed uh to a place that had uh more uh, little fake waterfalls and interesting exotic structures and uh uh, just kind of like it's almost more like a little fairyland kind of place. Uh, it's very pretty now, you know. It mm-hmm. really is. Mm-hmm. Did you go when you went? To I didn't the, go in. No. Oh, we did. No, yeah. We d- we we really did. In fact, I really. That's why I know I there's an ice cream place there. We really enjoyed it because it um, it has a little Japanese pavilion. It had an Indian from India pavilion, um, little fake waterfalls, little paths. Uh, yeah, so it's a nice garden. It's a very nice park. garden. And it's, got, it's a kind of garden park. And uh, I actually had no idea what the word meant because the name is still there. And and I had no clue because they don't explain what, what it is, you know, and what the word means. Uh, but now it's just it's this very lovely place you can go. And, and interestingly, it's open every day of the year. Huh. Which is exceptional. Yeah. Yeah. It's every day, all day long. Huh. I, you know, I think it would be a cool place to go with little kids. I think so too. They would probably enjoy running around and yeah. looking. And if you, if your kids can't really do museums, you could look at the, uh, the Geary, uh, Louis Vuitton foundation right. from the outside. It's already very impressive from the outside. The inside is also mind blowing. So it it's is. worth going in. But if you're with young kids, I understand you might not want to do all of that right. in the same day. But it, it sounds like a very fun, you know, it's a fun outing. It's a fun outing. And and now in the gardens, they actually have a couple of tiny little merry-go-rounds and things ah. like that, you know, and they, uh, uh, th- th- there are things there to keep children amused. Which is good. And a little playground and stuff like that. We like that. And then paths, you know, (laughs) where you can sit. And again, I think if I remember correctly, even a miniature, miniature little lake is in the Mm. middle of it, you know. Mm. It's just very pretty. Mm -hmm. It's very pretty. And so they don't have any animals left, right? No. Yeah. No. If I... I don't remember whether I'm imagining this or whether there may have been a couple of peacocks. I don't remember. I don't remember. But okay. otherwise, there were no one. No, they said. In apparently, they got rid of the other animals in the 1950s. Right, right, right. They had, you know, some basic little the kinds of animals you would expect to see in a kind of children's zoo type of place. Right. You know, that kind of thing. But uh, but it's very lovely and mm-hmm. it's it's big enough to enjoy without being vast. Yeah. You know. And uh, you're right. It's a perfect coupling uh, as an outing with going to see the Vuitton Foundation. And even again, if you don't want to take the time or spend the money to go inside the Vuitton Foundation, you can do uh, this. It does have a small charge. Yeah, it's probably a five or six yeah, euro kind of deal. Yeah, I think it was four or five euros or something yeah. like that. And Vuitton is probably like 15, 16. Probably. Something like that. You know. And it's best if they have... When we went to the Vuitton, they had a um, impressionist exhibit. Ah. And so it was packed. It was packed. Yes, right. yes. And so we had we reserved in advance. Yeah. Uh, and when we got there, I mean, everybody was saying, oh, you have to reserve or you won't get in, whatever. And when we got there, there was a fairly long line for people who didn't have reserved tickets, but they got in, yeah. you know. But anymore, because of the COVID thing, more, a lot more museums are going towards timed entry. For sure. So you, I don't know because they haven't reopened yet. No, they haven't reopened yet. Yeah. But but it's become what's interesting is that because of the Vuitton Foundation and then of course the park, 
the little jardin next to it, uh, that corner of Paris has become more popular mm. because it's not, it's a little remote. And a little bit. It's a little bit. It's, it's the kind of place where if you come to Paris, you don't think about going that far out. You yeah. Know? Uh, and now, of course, it is. And when we went, there was no specific art exhibit. It was just a few per- pieces of the permanent collection. But we went really to see the building. And there was already a line of people to get in mm-hmm. just to see the building. Mm-hmm. It was just, it's, a, it's in and of itself, it's impressive. And it's, and it's strange because it's, the building is weird, but you don't get lost in it. No. There are some buildings like that that are modern buildings where you have no idea how you got to that awful concrete staircase, right. you know, and this one doesn't, didn't do that to me. No, no, I think I don't, it seemed to me that it's fairly dense. I mean, dense in the sense that it's not sprawled out, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. so it's, it's compact and, uh, and and he makes use of all the different levels or the semi levels or whatever it is. It's yeah, like yeah. every time you turn, you have a different perspective, mm-hmm. and the point and the views of Paris are fabulous. Yes, yes, good views, very Absolutely nice views, fabulous. You yeah, know? and it was just it was really a beautiful experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think you could probably do it in half a day. Oh, the two of them, sure, sure, yeah, for sure. yeah, yeah. It's, right. Right. Um, I remember there were some restaurants and things uh, right around the metro station. Honestly, we went by a car. I don't really know. I oh, don't okay. know. We really did this time go by car, and uh, I don't know. But I do know that there was a cafe in the museum, mm-hmm. which is yes. typical. Yes. Uh, and there were a couple of food trucks outside. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting because it was like the whole thing is like very contemporary. The food trucks outside, the the the... the, the the visual aspect of the museum, it's kind of fun because you, you're just in this this little pocket of something, you know, at mm-hmm. the end of the Bois de Boulogne. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm sure that, you know, this is France, Annie. There's always some place to eat. That's true. <laughs> always. No matter and, you where know, you go. You I've, know. I've been known to poo-poo modern art, but I have to say that to me, that one's in a class of its own. It's it's way 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 nice. <laughs> it, 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 well, no. I I mean it's fun that you I'm actually I'm not that I care, but I think it's kind of fun that you like it. I I did see I have been to one other Gary building in uh, Seattle. He did a museum of rock and roll. Mm. Um, it's kind of fun. Uh, it, the the building inside is not as surprising, but. The concept was that the outside should look more like like a guitar. (laughs) (laughs) It kind of does, you know. Mm -hmm. It is kind of odd. Uh, His buildings are always uh, there's always something interesting and strange about them, no matter what, you know. But but this one I think is probably one of the best ones he's ever done. You know, I would have to agree. So we should go whenever they open again. Yeah, they will. They will. Yeah, I've, I've heard, I mean, I know that the Louvre is reopening on July 6th. We record this on uh, June 30th. Right. Probably won't be released until later. <laughs> but, uh, but I haven't heard about the Orsay setting a date for reopening yet. No, I, I think that uh, each institution probably is trying to figure out how to deal with the social distancing and stuff like that. Yeah. So. I don't know. There, there is no mandate that they all have to open at a specific time. Right. So I guess that the those who can will uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, the Louvre, of course, uh, really needs the money from people coming in. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, they have to be really careful because it. Uh, they have to make sure that everything is is set up for security. Yeah, yeah. The right. s- the smaller museums in Toulouse and stuff are open. Yeah, for the most part, and they're keeping distances and only allowing so many people in and right. all of that good stuff. Seems to be going pretty well. It seems to be going pretty well. I I would just assume that it's easier to manage a smaller space that way and control yeah. what's going on. Yeah. You know, I mean, what are they going to do? They, they're not going to be able to have hordes going to stand in front of the Mona Lisa anymore. It's just not going to happen, you nope. know. So they're obviously going to have to do something about all of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe what they'll do is hide her away and just project her virtually onto a wall. <laughs> I mean, why not? You no, can't get close to her anyway, you know? I think they need to just put her in a room off and have people wait outside. And just go, and in just go into that room. Yeah, and just go into that room. Well, 
Because there would still be a long line outside, but be outside. But of course, then they'd be worried about terror, terrorist attacks. So <laughs> you can't win. I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's I'm a, glad I'm not in charge. It's, yeah. It's be a, glad it's, it's Annie big, is not in charge. It's a big, big, big space. I mean, who, yeah. I don't want to have to worry about who's going to take care of it, you know. <laughs> Merci, Elise. You are quite welcome. Au revoir, Annie. everybody. Au revoir. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so. You can see them at patreon.com forward slash join us, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Join us, no spaces or dashes. Thank you all for supporting the show. Some of you for many years now, you are fantastic. And a shout out this week to new patrons, Maureen Arbuznik, Arbuznik, I think. Forgive me if I got it wrong, Maureen. Uh, Christine Stock and Michelle Riley. Thank you so much for becoming patrons and making this podcast possible. Michelle was the first person to sign up for the year, so she gets 12 months of rewards for a 10 month payment. And that's on until the end of October, by the way. Then it'll go up a little bit. But um, donating for the whole year will always give you a little bit of a, of a discount. I have to tell you that every time I see that a new person has signed up as a, as a patron, I am pumped. Uh, it renews my commitment to keep sharing about France and also give a voice to regular people who love France and want to talk about it. People like you. I don't care that you didn't write a bestseller book about France or that you don't have a huge following on Instagram. I want to talk to people who love France. So if you do, and if you have a suggestion for an episode, drop me a line, Annie at joinusinfrance.com. And speaking of that, on Facebook uh, this week, someone suggested that we talk about the Netflix uh, show series, Emily in Paris. So Elise is coming back tomorrow to record uh, and um, stay tuned for that next week on the podcast. For my personal update this week, I have to brag that I hit it out of the park twice this week with two recipes, gratin dauphinois, which I made for years using the method that I thought was the way you did it. And uh, I found a new method and I thought, oh, I got to try that. Man, it was so much easier and so much uh, more authentic. It was great. And also cassoulet. <laughs> now you might think that cassoulet comes easy to me because, you know, I was born and raised in the southwest of France, but I haven't actually made that dish that many times in my life. Well, except recently where I made it a bunch of times uh, because I've been cooking up a storm to write the Join Us in France cookbook. I'm digging up old recipes from old French cookbooks just to see what they said. And I'm reminded that these old cookbook authors were nothing like today's food bloggers. These old timers actually knew what they were talking about. <laughs> Sorry. How refreshing, though. Anyway, writing the cookbook is a huge time commitment, but I am on track for my ebook release during the first half of November and for the print book release a month later. I want it out there so you can order it as a Christmas gift for the Francophiles in your life. But really, I think you want the ebook as well because, I mean, don't you look up recipes on your phone or tablet all the time? I do. I don't know. It seems to me like... Anyway, reviews are still coming in from recipe testers. Thank you so much, testers. The ones that have been tested and rewritten and sent out again to new people are coming back where the testers say, I don't know. I... It was great. I don't know what to say. <laughs> so I'm really encouraged. It's hard for me to write well enough to sound like a native speaker. Because when you learn how to write in French, the run-on sentence is your default position. <laughs> and I have to battle that. I have an editor who's doing a great job, but sounding natural and writing well is uh, my goal. Just like I like to work on how I pronounce things, I want to work on how I write things as well. 
A quick COVID-19 update. Uh, we're not doing great in France. Uh, we're not seeing exponential growth at this point, but it could go there because people are not being very careful. And, you know, I don't know why that is, because we don't have leadership in France that is in denial of science. I think what might be happening is that people are sick of uh, taking precautions and also that TV stations uh, have to fill the air and they keep inviting people who are controversial and express uh, very uh, weird views about what's happening with this virus instead of keeping it simple. The reality is we know by now that wearing a mask works and that you should be wary of going anywhere where you need to remove your mask, which includes cafes, restaurants, anywhere you eat or drink, also places where you exercise without a mask, things like that. So, but they can't just keep it that simple. They have to create controversial uh, topics so people listen to them and uh, keep watching. And it, I think that's what's causing all, this, uh, all these problems. Unfortunately, that means that you won't be able to come back to France uh, for now. Uh, my guess, and I think my guess is as good as anyone, is that we're going to have to wait until there's a, a vaccine that's widely available. And there you have it. And this week I'm going to get my flu shot because uh, we we usually get the flu shot at my house. My husband does it every year. I have sometimes strayed the last two, three years. I haven't done it. But this year I'm definitely going to do it. So, you know, uh, be, be cautious. Uh, wear your mask whenever you're around other people. And uh, yeah, don't go anywhere where uh, you should, you will have to take off your mask. That's, that's, I think that's the bottom line is, you know, if you need to take off the mask, don't do it around other people. Voila. I can't wait for this thing to be over. Honestly, please. Oh, it's been like almost a full year. Like, oh, I'm sick of it. Like, like mm. but, you know, I, re I recorded an episode about the um, 1918 pandemic with Elise recently. And of course, they had it a lot worse. So I, I feel bad complaining because my situation is actually pretty good, but I feel like complaining because there's so much that I haven't been able to do this year that I wanted to do, but such as life, uh, people are subject to viruses. Send questions or feedback to any at joinusinfrance.com. Thank you so much for listening. Next week on the podcast... Elise and I chit-chat about Emily in Paris, the Netflix show extraordinaire. <laughs> I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France travel podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2020 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.